Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Invest Africa. I'm Alicia Sekham. Well, in recent months, sovereign wealth funds have been opening across Africa as resource-rich countries look to manage and ring fence their revenues and ease the impact of commodity price volatility. JP Morgan says that during the past two years, 15 state funds have been set up or are being considered in Africa. Figures from the African Development Bank shows that Africans' sovereign wealth funds are worth around $114 billion. Pilani Nyalunga brings us this report. Natural resources and massive infrastructure development are driving African economic growth. Sovereign wealth funds' growth in Africa is due to growth in commodity prices and foreign exchange reserves. JP Morgan says countries are putting their surpluses into government-owned funds. The sovereign wealth funds started off um, globally as a tool of fiscal discipline. Okay, it's a way to save money and uh, invest to advance uh, national development. Uh, most sovereign wealth funds started out with uh, two mandates, which is to provide stabilization support um, to the economy and also to provide a saving space for future generations. Angola launched a state wealth fund worth $5 billion last year. Earlier, the continent's biggest oil producer, Nigeria, set up a $1 billion fund. Algeria has the largest sovereign wealth fund in the continent, over $77 billion, followed by Libya. We asked Chris Hart, a chief strategist, if these sovereign wealth funds are universally applicable. A lot of countries are in the initial growth phase rather than at a point where they're actually generating an enormous amount of, uh, how could you say, um, uh, resources that can be put aside. But another um, use for the sovereign wealth funds is in fact to try and um, uh, utilize foreign exchange reserves. But Ard believes that African countries are jumping the gun with sovereign wealth funds and should rather plow back into their economies by creating conducive investment environments through improving transparency and governance. Pilani Nyalunga, CNBC Africa, Johannesburg. Joining me at the desk to take a closer look and give context and analysis to the state of sovereign wealth funds on the continent is Brian Lamini, country risk analyst at Rand Merchant Bank. And joining us from our Cape Town Bureau is Milan Ritfeldt, Africa analyst at Investec Asset Management as well. A warm welcome to both of you. And Brian, let's perhaps start off with you here at the desk because where we're looking at a sustained global economic uncertainty, let's unpack the state of global sovereign wealth funds right now, what kind of asset growth are we seeing in that regard? Well, um, there's been quite a, quite a bit of um, growth, um, say, between the 2011 and 2012 period, particularly, we see quite a big increase in, in those funds. But I think what's noteworthy is the countries that are looking to start funds, um, that uh, displays the level of appetite. I mean, you're seeing noises coming out of Tanzania, Kenya, uh, even Mozambique is looking at it. We've seen Nigeria um, reshaping theirs, Angola as well. So the appetite is there. I think everyone is realizing that, you know, um, uh, natural resources are finite and uh, saving for the future is necessary. Milan, let's get your perspective on the kind of growth that we're seeing in African countries when it comes to a generation of sovereign wealth funds. How are you rating growth on the African continent relative to what we're seeing on a global scale? Well, I think certainly Africa is, is the continent where we're seeing the most growth of, of new funds emerging and also existing funds receiving uh, greater amounts of capital. So, you know, if you compare the first generation of sovereign wealth funds, perhaps, in the Middle East and Asia, uh, the next 10 years, I think we'll see a prol proliferation of funds across Africa. If we get a little bit specific, I mean, uh, Africa accounts for roughly 3% of those global sovereign wealth funds. The largest sovereign funds sit in Libya and then Algeria. Again, in comparative terms, it's disproportionately lower, even on those fronts, uh, to the global players. So what kind of growth are you actually envisaging here? I see, a num the, of course, the number of funds increasing greatly. Uh, then it's a question for policymakers, and it's a question of how high commodity prices go and how strong production is um, to see them to see how much capital these funds actually manage one day. But I think maybe in the next decade or so, we could see as much as as two to three trillion 
uh, dollars being managed outside of Af from African sovereign wealth funds. And that's exactly it, Brian, uh, reliance on what the commodity markets do, because uh, something interesting that I picked up in doing research for this interview is that there's a strong positive association between the value of total sovereign wealth assets and commodity prices. Mm -hmm. So a sustained rise in commodity uh, prices and significant revenues from those commodity exports have led to the establishment of mm -hmm. sovereign wealth funds in a number of African countries, especially those oil and gas exports. Uh, currently, 58% of those assets worldwide are derived from oil and gas revenues. Yet, you've got a player like Nigeria, relatively uh, new to the game, with a small fan size compared to the likes of Libya, for example. So does that surprise you? Well, um, due to the you know, historical legacies on the continent, political um, um, will hasn't been there, but more especially its capacity by some of these countries to um, you know, get get on board or get acquainted with with this concept of saving for the future mm -hmm. and understanding the mismatch between a finite resource and you know saving it for future generations. But I think we're getting to a point where you know there's more accountability being um, uh, asked f asked for from from the you know civil society, the locals themselves. They want to see you know things uh, moving in a particular direction. But of note, um, you mentioned that um, in terms of growth, Africa definitely will be um, an area of growth in terms of funds under management, say over the next decade, because there's a clear mismatch uh, between the abundance of natural resources, the commodity boom that we see, and the funds under management or the creation of, 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 yeah. of, 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 of or, uh, or the aggregation, aggregate number of, of funds under management. So that is an area which definitely will 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 um, look to grow what is of particular importance is the advisors as well to these african sovereigns to seeing the norwegians which, which have the biggest um, funds coming um, around to to advise african countries we're seeing the world bank the imf um, being policy anchors and advising the likes of a tanzania to say look you've got um, very very big gas resources, you might actually want to start saving yeah. and, and, and looking at it from a long term uh, or, or, or from a sustainability model. Let's take a look at where then Milan, South Africa fits in this entire equation. Well, I mean, the proposal for South Africa to create a fund has been, has been mentioned by a few people, including a particular Minister Patel. Um, I, I think South Africa is not particularly well placed to have a fund. I mean, they they generally arise from countries that have a surplus of fiscal revenues associated with natural resources, which we, we don't really have. We have a lot of fiscal resources, but I wouldn't say we have a surplus. Or they arrive from countries with persistent trade surpluses and high savings rates, which we certainly don't have. So, mm -hmm. so if we were to create a sovereign wealth fund, we'd have to really create it by intervening in the currency. So I think it's, the South African discussion is perhaps a bit of a smokescreen for a larger debate around the management of the currency. Your view on that, Brian? Uh, do you do you share that view? Um, absolutely. Um, I think the the, the key um, differentiator here is you know there should be an access on 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 what government spends and um, how much it receives, mm -hmm. and that access should be put away. Um, there's many models out there. We've seen Ghana with a different model where they have elected to spend seventy percent and uh, save automatically 30% and they don't rely on the surplus model. But, but the moral of the story is that you know, whatever is in excess should be saved because that is now going to, obviously, the savings is going to generate investment And that's in the exactly it, and uh, catered to future uh, yeah. uh, investment growth. I mean, uh, we're looking at sovereign wealth funds being established for the purpose of price and revenue stabilization, mm. and that's why a lot of these mm. uh, funds are coming out of those commodity producing areas. We've also seen that it acts as a mechanism to smooth their revenues mm. and expenditures in order to effect better control of government expenditure planning. Where this is in place, does it work to that effect? Well, I think the most important thing, apart from the mechanisms of whether it works well, is ultimately you should be able 
to diversify the economy away from the finite resource. So it should lead to economic transformation in the long run mm -hmm. and less dependency on whatever commodity is, at, is, at, um, is in question here. So in between that, you've got the smoothening out, you've got it maybe um, five or whatever, whatever um, little bit uh, of, of the fund per year um, is, could be drawable, where they could draw on it to smooth out whatever mm -hmm. effects. But the long run benefit should be that you should transform the economy. And the fund shouldn't, uh, in theory, do what government is supposed to do in the sense of um, building you know, infrastructure where government could actually do that. It should be investing on a, say, 20-year view plus. And where the focus is on return. Yeah, primarily so. Right? So Milan, we've got interesting controversy around the merit of these funds to start off with. I mean, on the one hand, uh, we've got advocates for the sovereign wealth funds saying that these funds can help boost economic growth and prosperity for current and future generations. Conversely, we've got the critics, uh, you know, saying that these funds could give it too much power to the governments themselves and could switch the global economy away from liberalism and therefore hamper market competitiveness. Which side of the debate do you say? On. Well, I agree. I mean, I think that debate really reflects uh, some people viewing sovereign wealth funds as an instrument of, of state capitalism and, and greater state control over the economy. I, I think it really depends on the kinds of governance structures you have for the funds. And I think the, the overwhelming majority of funds are, are very sort of passive long-term investors um, without a particular strategic motive or some kind of mercantilist motive. But, but there certainly are funds um, in, in countries where there have been some questions raised as to is this fund really a commercial player with a focus on, on investment returns or is it really a sort of tool of, of government policy and state policy and I think that line is a fine line but, yeah. but there are certain actions that can be taken to make sure that those funds are you know, completely isolated from the political process and, and really just passive investors focused on generating long-term investment returns. Milan, how exactly would you manage that intent? Is there a complete reliance then on governance and transparency and that the bottom line? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think governance, governance and transparency are the single most important questions um, that policymakers need to ask themselves when they're creating funds. And I think there is a lot of good examples out there of how to do this right. You think of Norway, um, but you can also think of Chile and, and Botswana. Um, some funds in the Middle East have, have exceptional governance standards and if you can get that right, um, I think you are, you have gone a long way to, to serving the purpose that a sovereign wealth fund should mm. serve. Brian, where governance and transparency seem to be the missing ingredients, I mean why is it proving to be so elusive? Well, in fact, uh, that is now the part and, and parcel of the explanation for why African funds haven't actually or, why we, or rather why we haven't seen you know, the numbers that we should have been seeing on, mm -hmm. on the continent. Governance is very important, but I think a, f a very, very um, clear um, mandate in terms of independence is also um, necessary where, where these funds are, are concerned because you don't want political interference. And the fund should be given a clear mandate as to what returns or how it should play. And you really don't want to keep on, you know, changing and chopping and changing its mandate or its strategy um, every so often. You, you, everything should be clear and there should be a long-term um, strategy and then you leave the fund to deliver uh, you know, on whatever mandate. What lessons are there to be drawn from the global players? I mean, we've highlighted mm. Norway, uh, Chile, mm. China, China even, China. running successful sovereign wealth funds. Yep. Uh, the, the, what should we be giving priority? Well, you, you even see, I mean, the likes of the Abu Dhabi investment mm -hmm. um, uh, fund as well. That fund is bigger than um, the, the country's GDP. Um, but, I mean, when the Dubai crisis happened, you, you, you didn't see the fund, you know, um, going to bail out, um, uh, you know, parts of um, Dubai holdings or, or those bad investments um, to the extent where, you know, the fund's mandate was in question. The fund is investing for a long-term return. Government should sit down 
and um, negotiate with, 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 with whichever players were, were in trouble or in question at the time. So there was a clear mandate as to what the fund can do and what it can't do. Yeah, well, let's leave it there with you for now. We're heading into a short commercial break, but we say goodbye to a Cape Town guest, Milan Redfeld, who's an Africa analyst at Investec Asset Management. Thanks so much, Milan, for having joined us today. When we return, we hear the views from the CFO of the Gabonese Fund for Strategic Investment. So we'll see you in two minutes.